Hello and good morning. I am Jackson Brown, pastor of the Grove Deaf Church. We are happy you could join us this weekend. I want to let you know that if you're not yet following us on Instagram, we do have an Instagram page, Grove Deaf Ministry. That page there has updates, information, work, weekly encouragements. So we want you to find the information there every single week. This weekend, we are blessed to have the opportunity to have Damon Horton. He is our guest speaker this weekend. He has a fabulous message. I listen to it, and I want you to listen to it as well. So this weekend, we're going to be integrating the deaf services and the interpreting services together. Lori will be interpreting for Damon. And so I'm hoping that you will take the opportunity now to watch, worship the Lord together, and listen to this message. God bless you and have a wonderful weekend. Hi, my name is Daniel Bishop and I'm the lead pastor at the Grove Community Church. We're glad that you could join us for church online. If you're new to the Grove, we'd love for you to fill out a connect card. If you're watching through the website, it'll be at the top of your page. If you're watching through YouTube, it will be at the very bottom under description. Fill that out and we'd love to connect with you. Also, if you're new, we're offering a class Sunday afternoon at 12.30 p.m. right here, starting point. You liked how I did that? I feel like I'm the Disney Channel. I want a hamburger. <laughs> All right, I'm a little bit more serious. Uh, starting point is a class designed for new people in our church. Uh, we're gonna have a Zoom class at 12.30 on Sunday where you can sign up, register for that online at thegrove.cc. Our staff is gonna be there to introduce themselves and tell you about each department. And more than anything, we just want to get to know you. It should be a fun experience. So join us by signing up 12.30 on Sunday. Last but not least, if you need prayer or anything, you need to talk to someone um, on the screen below me. There's a couple options of how you can receive live prayer. We're here to serve you, and care for you, and also um, to worship the Lord together. So if you're at home, would you stand as uh, Jenny Price leads us in worship? Hey church, welcome. We're so glad to be worshiping with you today from your home. Wherever you are, we are going to raise a hallelujah to our God who reigns. Our passage today is Ephesians 5, and it tells us to be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another and encouraging one another, giving thanks to our God who has given us life in Jesus Christ. So will you, wherever you are, with your family, in your home, sing with us and raise a hallelujah. No matter what we face, we can sing in the storm. I raise it, hallelujah, in the presence of my enemy. And I raise it, hallelujah, louder than the unbelief. Yeah. And I raise it, hallelujah, my And I raise it, hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roll Up from the ashes Hope will arise 
Amen, church. This is, this is how we fight our battles. We sing a hallelujah and we raise that to our God who reigns. And I know that this has been a longer season than we could have all even realized. And it's different and it's hard and it's, it's harder than we could have realized for many. And for some, it's been a great joy. We have all of the above in our different emotions as a church. But one thing that we can know for sure from our study of Ephesians is that we can raise a hallelujah and we can sing. And why? It's because of our God. It's because that we were dead in our sin and we were lost in darkness. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love toward us made us alive together with Christ, even when we were dead, even when we were hopeless and lost in the dark. And that is the good news of the gospel. That is why we sing. We raise that hallelujah because no matter what comes our way, no matter the financial hardship, no matter if the global pandemic continues on, no matter if we're still isolated and stuck at home, we can raise a hallelujah in the middle of that because of who our God is, because we have a loving Father who sent his son, Jesus Christ. And this is an old song, an old hymn that we're gonna sing called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So we wanna come together and remember that we have a heavenly Father who now calls us beloved children and we belong to him. We can take heart and take hope in him no matter what comes our way because we are his and he holds us. So receive this, sing this with us and hold to this truth today, church.
perfect God who reigns above. He reigns over the earth. We belong to Him. Our hearts are resting now. We belong to You. Father, we belong, and this is our greatest hope, our greatest treasure, that we are yours. Will you remind us of that today as we hear from your word, as you call us to be imitators of you, as beloved children, help us walk in love, help us sing and live in response to who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. We pray that you would give us ears to hear your voice speak to us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team. You did an awesome job. I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker for the weekend. His name is Damon Horton. If you remember Grove Family, he preached back at the Grove in September. Uh, just an awesome man of God. He's a church planner in Long Beach, also a professor at Cal Baptist University, and he's going to come and share God's word from Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 20. So let me pray for him and for us as we hear God's word and that it would actually change us as we live for him. Father God, we come before you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And as we listen to this message coming from Damon, uh, Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, would change our hearts, our minds, and would change the way that we live. Uh, Father, we want to live to bring you glory. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Grove Church, it's a privilege and a blessing to be with you all today. Continuing with the Where New Life is Found series. The beautiful truth about where new life is, it's found in Christ. And as we walk through this passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 today, we're going to be continuing on with what Pastor Daniel had already communicated from the previous weeks. The beautiful truth about Christianity is that this is a living faith because our risen Lord and Savior is living and he is giving eternal life to everyone, no matter your gender, your ethnicity, or where you are in the world today, that we can cry out to him and receive salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And when we receive salvation, we are actually given new life. Christianity is not a belief system that says, oh, I want to do a better job in the future. I can earn good brownie points with God. No, no, no. It's actually the opposite. It's when we actually declare spiritual bankruptcy and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I cannot pay off the sin debt that I have racked up my whole life, committing all of these grievances against the holy and righteous God. And I need you to save me. I believe that the blood that you shed was the only acceptable payment that the Father received to pay off my sin debt. And see, Christianity is a faith in which it says that we were once dead in our sins. But when we profess faith in Jesus and by grace through faith believe everything that he did was for us and it can be attributed to us, we receive new life. But having new life actually comes with a responsibility that we must have a new lifestyle. And the good thing about Jesus is that he deposits in us almost better, if you will, than the reality of a direct deposit or that Venmo that comes as a surprise or even that stimulus check that you maybe had just received. The reality of receiving eternal life through Jesus is a direct deposit, not of money that will be spent, but of God, the Holy Spirit himself. And now every follower of Jesus around the world can live spirit-filled. And this text today that we're gonna walk through is exactly what it looks like to have spirit-filled living. I think the main point for this sermon today is this. Spirit-filled Christians, we can accomplish three things. Number one, we can imitate God daily. Secondly, we can initiate good deeds. And then thirdly, we can ignore godless deeds. Let me say that one more time so we can process through this before we dive into our text. Spirit-filled Christians imitate God daily. We initiate good deeds and we ignore godless deeds. So let's focus on our first point. We're going to find this in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. So what we're going to talk about in this first point is how we can imitate God daily. Our text says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved 
children. Paul is continuing his thoughts from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And what we see here is that he is identifying just how Jesus' followers are called to live on mission every day for Jesus. The language here literally calls us to be imitators of God. In the Greek in which Paul used when he wrote this letter, it's where we get the word mime in English. The amazing thing about a mime is that a mime is seen performing actions but they don't have any words. So it's the reality of their actions that is noticed first before the things that are communicated verbally from them. And we are called simply to mime God, to imitate the decisions in life, the words that we often say should be in harmony and in alignment with what we see God has done, is doing, and will do. And the perfect example of who we are to mimic, if you will, and give a lifestyle of imitation to is Jesus Christ. Now there's a difference between doing an impression of somebody and actually imitating somebody. Impressions are short-term reenactments, if you will, of an individual. But when you have an imitation, it is a consistent action where one is consistently seeking to imitate another person. Now, my daughter Isabel is amazing at impressions. Often when we're at the dinner table, we will laugh for 30 minutes because we'll just throw different names of people that we know and she will give maybe a 15 to 20 second impression of that person. Sometimes it's a certain look that she gives. Sometimes she changes her voice but she is an amazing impressioner of people. Well, the reality is, is that God is not calling us, those who follow Jesus, to give impressions of Jesus, where we act like God or we seek to live righteously for 30 seconds or one minute at a time, but rather we are seeking to imitate Christ on an ongoing basis. We who have embraced Jesus have been given the Holy Spirit as a gift to empower us to continuously seeking to imitate God daily. So the question is, how exactly are we to do this? Paul continues on, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So how is it that Jesus expressed love for us? He volunteered when nobody else could or would to climb on a cross and to receive the full wrath that God had do for us because of our sin debt, Jesus, who was perfect and sinless, volunteered to climb on a cross and receive that eternal sentencing in a matter of hours on our behalf. He surrendered his life and he was buried for three days. And then he resurrected on that third day. And that right there is when God the Father told the whole universe that the payment that Jesus made for our sin debt has been fully accepted and approved. So the resurrection of Jesus that we just celebrated on Resurrection Sunday actually is the reminder that the payment that he made for our sins has been approved. And now sinners from every walk of life can hear the gospel and put their faith in Jesus. Now we as followers of Jesus, when we make the word of Jesus known, when we make the works of Jesus known, we are actually spreading this sweet, fragrant aroma into our world. Almost like when you walk into a room and there's a stench, a smell, or there's maybe a stale, oldy, moldy smell, if you will, and you spray Febreze or you spray body spray or some type of an air freshener, it is gonna chase away that foul stank aroma and there is this new sweet smelling inviting aroma well the gospel is being sprayed out to the world where the stench of death is ruling and reigning in the lives of people globally and the sweet fragrance of what Jesus has done that love filled fragrance of his actions is actually spread through Christians when we communicate Jesus's story so walking in love means that we are to communicate the story of Jesus and at the same time with our works, consider actions that please God rather than our flesh. This is why Paul goes on to say, but among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. 
So now Paul kind of leads us more deeply into what it looks like to live as imitators of God on a daily day basis. He is calling us to assess our lifestyle choices. As those who have inherited the kingdom of God by embracing Christ as Savior, our lifestyle rhythms should not include habitual, unconfessed, unrepentant sexual immorality, forms of impurity, greed, or idolatry. Now, when it comes to sexual immorality, this phrase in the Greek is the word porneia, which encompasses every type of sexual sin. Now, we have to understand as those who are people of the book, how God has given a framework for sexual expression. We actually can see that the word of God frames out righteous sexual ethics. And what we see consistently throughout the scriptures is that God has designed sex for mutual enjoyment between one man and one woman in side of the covenant of marriage. It's almost like a fireplace. You and I know that a fireplace is wonderful to look at. It's amazing to admire, especially on the few cold nights that we have here in Southern California, that when you actually open up the flue and you light logs and you put them on fire, it's beautiful, it's comforting, there's warmth. And it's protected when it stays within the framework and the boundaries that have been set up. But when that fire gets outside of the confines of the fireplace, it is destructive. And it destroys lives, it destroys homes, it damages, and it moves away from its intended purpose of bringing light, comfort, and heat, and warmth. And what we see with the sexual framework that we have in Scripture is that God has given us this gift of sexuality and expression to be enjoyed within the framework and the boundaries that God has given us in scripture. Any sexual activity and expression outside of that boundary is sin and it destroys and it ravages our lives both inside and out. And that's why we who imitate God on a day-to-day basis as followers of Jesus must have righteous sexual expressions. At the same time, we need to stay away from any kind of impurity, which is any type of sin. We also must forsake greed. Greed is basically this unceasing desire to have more when we already had enough. Living in the midst of a global pandemic, this is why we can have a missional testimony by not being hoarders or getting more than we need. Even actually doing the opposite of Uh, being greedy is sharing and, and giving to others when they have expressed and felt needs. The reason why we want to watch our behavior on a day-to-day basis as imitators of God is because of what Paul says, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. You see, as imitators of God on a day-to-day basis, all of these umbrella type sins that house other types of sins that are nuanced under these umbrellas should not be normal practices of Jesus' followers. They should not be a part of our reputation. Now, when we relapse and we fall into sin, that's understandable. Even though Christianity is a faith that is consumed by grace, it does not mean that we are perfect. It does not mean that we are better than others. It means that we are forgiven. And we are more self-aware of our selfishness, our flesh, and our sinful realities that we purposefully choose to do as followers of Jesus. And as those who have embraced Jesus Christ, we have to understand that our reputation should not be aligned with sin because God's reputation is not aligned with sin. So if we are going to be imitators of God, we must make sure that we imitate his pursuit of holiness That's who our God is. So when we sin, we must be aware of it. We must confess it. We must ask for forgiveness. And because of the finished work of Jesus, we receive forgiveness by grace through faith. And the works that we do and the words that we say should not be foul. They should not be vulgar and they should not be shameful, especially when it comes to expressions of sexuality, because that is the speech that Paul is telling us to not participate in. We must have speech that is filled with thankfulness and gratitude in all circumstances. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So Paul then concludes this opening portion by saying, for this, you can be sure that no immoral impure or greedy person, such as a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. 
For because of such things, God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. We must watch the company that we keep. Now, obviously, practicing social distancing and having guidelines from our governor and our local mayors and our county health departments is preventing us from normal interface interaction with other people. But the reality is, is that we don't live in an isolated reality normally. We live amongst both those who have embraced Jesus Christ and those who have never heard of Jesus or they have rejected Jesus. So we must understand that it's not about being antisocial. It's not about creating a lifestyle that excludes people that don't know Jesus. No, 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 it's the opposite. It is living as those who know Jesus amongst those who know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus and making sure that when we are in their presence, we are making that sweet fragrance of what Jesus has done more known day by day. The reality is, is that we are not called to participate into sinful actions on an ongoing basis with those who know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. We are to imitate God by what we do and what we say so that it pleases him. Since we live lives amongst both saints and the lost, we must do well to now initiate good deeds when we are with them. That means this is how we are to walk in the light. And that leads me to our second point. The second point is this, we are called to initiate good deeds. And we'll find this in verses 8 through 14. The text says, for you were once darkness, not in darkness, but you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Now, the phrasing that Paul used puts a very strong emphasis on you were. This is that idea of new life. Christianity is not a faith that says, oh man, here's a resolution for what I want my life to look like. Or it's not a faith that says, well, I'm gonna turn a new leaf and I'm gonna do better from here on out. No, Christianity is a faith that acknowledges two truths. I was born dead in sin, separated from God, yet Jesus is the one who bridges the gap between me and God. And when I embrace Jesus, I am now alive. I have been resurrected. I didn't become a, a better person. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. So the word darkness is what once consumed who we used to be, but now we have been consumed by the light of Christ. And the reality is if the world is going to see the light of Christ, they have to see us. They have to engage with us. What's amazing is the idea is that people who are not in the light of Christ, but they are in darkness, they claim that they are enlightened based on what knowledge that they may have or what insight or life experiences that they have shared. And they think by receiving this enlightenment that they are walking in the light in a similar way that we are in a right relationship with God. It's almost like individuals who during the winter months may go to a tanning salon or perhaps maybe you're itching to go to a tanning salon when the guidelines are lifted. Well, the reality is for a tanning salon, you go and you receive artificial enlightenment, but it gives a snapshot of an appearance for a moment of what that artificial light has changed the coloration of your skin to look like. But progressively over the course of time, that artificial light and that artificial color begins to fade. Now, the reality of what we see is that when the world claims, oh, I've been enlightened, well, they have been enlightened by an artificial light, a counterfeit light. But the reality of who we are is that we who are followers of Christ, we are walking in the light perpetually, not artificially, but realistically because our risen Lord is alive. So since we are not in darkness, we must show the world what it looks like to be in the light of the Lord. And we can initiate good deeds by choosing to love as children of light for the fruit of life consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And we can find out what pleases the Lord. You see, the stronger that a light is, the faster the darkness runs from it. The reality is, is that when we collectively, as the global church, spread the aroma of Christ, make Jesus known, communicate the truth of the gospel, we are letting our light that we are walking in shine. And when we come together as the body of Christ, the darkness has no option but to retreat. That's why we must continuously be praying for a revival, that when 
we are allowed to gather in mass once again, that collectively we are all walking in the light, letting our light shine, and we will see the darkness retreat from our communities, from our homes, from our neighborhoods, from our cities, our nation, and our world. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we are initiating good deeds by loving others, by sharing with others, by preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, we won't have anything to do with what Paul says, with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul said, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, the people who are the consistent workers of darkness. This is a warning to Christians to not join in sinning actions with other people who are unrepentant in their sinful actions. Here in verse 11, what we see is that Paul's language actually gets stronger. And what he is saying is not a suggestion, but it's a command for Christians to stop fellowshipping with the fruitless deeds of darkness. So let me just make it plain and simple. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul is calling out sin in the life of Jesus' followers. That's right. Christianity is not a faith that says that once you embrace Jesus, now you have obtained sinless perfection. No, we're human beings. We make mistakes and we make sinful choices. So we must learn to embrace our humanity and we must learn to call the real what it is, our flesh and our willing uh, disobedience to Christ. That's why we must follow Paul's words when he says it is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is exposed by light when it becomes visible and everything is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Now these are very powerful words. See, here's the challenge, Grove Church, that Paul through the Holy Spirit, is wanting us to hear from these words today. When it comes to Christians speaking about sin issues, if we're going to speak about the sin issues and exposing the deeds of darkness, then we better make sure that we ourselves are not partaking in these sinful actions and we are not fellowshipping with these sins in the privacy of a hidden lifestyle. This is why Paul reminds us that we must be called out of hidden darkness and become those who consistently walk in the light. Now, I want you to take heart, brother and sister, in faith today. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 reminds us that if we say that we have no sin, guess what? We're lying. We do. We sin on a consistent basis, even as Jesus' followers. The reality then helps us understand from that same passage that when we sin, we can confess our sin and we can receive forgiveness from God for the sins that we commit because God is faithful, meaning he will always forgive us and he is just, meaning God is right to forgive us because Jesus is the one who on the cross absorbed the sentencing the wrath of God for our sins. So God will never pour his wrath on any Jesus follower because Jesus has absorbed it down to the last drop. So what we see is that God is having an open door policy for every Christian around the world who is struggling with sin, who is fighting with their flesh and losing to temptation, that we can run to God who has an open door policy to forgive us, to love us, and to now give us strength by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to live in accordance to Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 13 so that the Holy Spirit can give us strength to say no to our flesh, no to the things of the world, no to sin, no to addictions, and keep on walking in the righteousness. See, when Paul says, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you, this may be a hymn that the early church sang, but it has a dual purpose. I'm convinced that it is calling those who are dead in sin. Everyone who may be watching that has never embraced Christ as Savior, this is a call for you to come and repent and receive the light of Christ. But it's also a call for those who are alive in Christ, but we're sleeping in sin to wake up, to confess our sin and to receive the forgiveness and grace of God. Here's what I want you to understand is that the word of God should break us. But brokenness is not a bad thing. 
especially when it comes to allowing our light to shine in a dark world. Let me explain it this way. A few years ago, my wife and I were asked to minister at a church and they had what was called a blackout party where they put construction paper on all the windows and the doors and they had black lights that they set up and they asked everybody to wear white clothes or fluorescent clothes. So all the lights were turned off and we walked in with our two kids and when we went in there, they began to hand everybody glow sticks. Now, my youngest daughter, Lola, was about two or three years old at this time. Lola had never seen a glow stick in her life. And I remember giving her the glow stick and I said, here you go, Miha, you can play with this and you can see it glow. And so she began to look at it and it didn't glow. And she began to shake it and nothing happened. And then she threw it across the room and I said, what are you doing? She said, daddy, it's broke. It doesn't work. And I said, well, actually, Miha, which means daughter, I said, you have to break it in order for it to work. And she was like, what do you mean? Because in her mind, every time mommy and daddy mentioned the word break or broke, she knew it couldn't be fixed. But now here, daddy has given her a new philosophy that says something has to be broken first before it would work and shine. And so I took that glow stick and I picked it up and I snapped it in the middle and all of a sudden fluorescent orange magically popped out of nowhere. Lola was like, do it again, dad. So I said, okay, Miha. So I broke it again. She said, do it again, do it again. So I did it repeatedly and then I made it into the necklace and now she had this fluorescent orange necklace hanging around her neck. I went up to the stage to do my sound check, was gone for maybe three minutes. I come back and Lola probably has 400,000 glow sticks illuminating her little body now because she had broken them because she knew it would not shine in the dark unless it was broken first. Beloved, this is what the Spirit of God is telling us today, is that we who have not been imitating God daily, we who have not been initiating good deeds, we who have never embraced Christ Jesus, today we can see brokenness as a good thing that the spirit of the living God would break us from our unrighteousness, break us from our habitual sin addictions, and then allow the light of Christ to shine through us once we have been broken. Because brokenness in the hands of a good God makes things beautiful. Jesus wants your life to be radiantly shining for the glory of Jesus. And your brokenness is not something to run from. It's something to embrace so that God can make your brokenness beautifully shine for him in a dark world. See, we have to be a generation that says we will push back the darkness by walking in love together, initiating good deeds as imitators of God. We got to be honest with our struggles because God uses our brokenness for his glory. And when we now become broken and in the hands of God, we can now focus on our final perspective, which is ignoring godless deeds. And now we come to our third and final point. And I wanna be very clear and direct with this last point. We are called to ignore godless deeds. This is what we read in Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. What Paul says is be careful then, very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. This is not a suggestion. This is a legitimate command and it's coming right out of the command to be awakened and in the light. So when we are awake and we are given new life in Jesus or those in new life when we've been struggling with unconfessed sin and we're coming out of that darkness of the sin that ensnared us, we are to now walk wise. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So to walk wise must be the application of the knowledge of God's word. Now, throughout Ephesians, Grove Church, you've been walking through this. Paul has given you the exact phrasing of what it looks like for wisdom. In Ephesians chapter one, verses eight and nine, wise living reconsiders the gospel consistently. I remember Tim Keller is the one who says that the gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian faith. Rather, the gospel is the A to Z of the Christian faith. It's the message that fuels us with hope. The gospel is not a simple message we put at the end of a sermon. No, the gospel is the motivation for us to get up and be imitators of God because we have the ability to do it because the spirit of God lives inside of us. Wise living also in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 says that it receives the teachings of scripture which have been revealed and the content by the Holy Spirit. So we are to receive the word of God. In addition, wise living, according to Ephesians 3.10, means that we reveal the church to the world, the multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multilingual people of God all around the world. See, 
Paul then tells us that we are called to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, this phrase about making the most of every opportunity, other versions of Scripture say redeem the time. The idea is about maximizing the moment before it expires. Now, living, social distancing and quarantining and all these things, staying at home, you know what? Some of us are probably facing the dilemma of having expired food. I remember a week or so ago, the days bleed together. I can't remember what day it was now, but I wanted a bowl of cereal. So I got the bowl, got my cereal, got a pound of sugar to pour in my cereal, and I went to grab the milk, and I looked at the expiration date, and I saw that it was well over a week expired. Well, I have a poor sense of smell, so I can't smell that well. Normally, I ask my wife, Alicia, to smell something for me and tell me if it's good or bad. Alicia was still asleep, so I said, well, I don't want to wake her up over something so silly. So as soon as I popped the top, man, I smelled spoiled milk. And I knew this ain't cottage cheese. This is curdled milk. So I went and threw it away, and I missed that moment to have a delicious bowl of cereal with a pound of sugar because I missed the opportunity. Well, in a greater way, not about bowls of cereal or food that expires. God gives us redeemable moments every day where we can maximize that moment for the glory of God by being imitators of God, initiating good deeds and also ignoring godless deeds. See, when somebody says something hurtful to you, which is a high probability of living in close quarters with roommates, with friends and with family, you can make the most of that moment by redeeming it by not clapping back at them in your flesh, but actually realizing I don't have to be a slave to my flesh and respond back hurtfully to them. When somebody falsely accuses you of something wrong, you don't have to come back at them in the flesh. No, you can redeem the opportunity, ignore the godless deed, initiate good deeds by forgiving them and loving them through that moment. See, we have to ignore godless deeds so that we won't live foolish anymore. Then we will be able to understand what the will of the Lord is. This phrasing about knowing what God's will is, I'll be honest with you. I'm in a moment where I'm struggling like, Lord, I need to know what your will is. Lord, none of us knew that this was gonna take place in this time of our lifestyle, that, that all these guidelines and restrictions and that this global pandemic, none of us knew about this six weeks ago, God. So the reality is, help me know your will for me and my family as we live on mission for Jesus. The language of this is about continuously seeking to know what God's will is and we can actually know the will of God. Now, the phrasing is about like putting a puzzle together. I remember there was a time when we were living in North Carolina and me and my family put together a thousand piece puzzle of a globe and it had every country on it with information about that country. Now, the process is that we open the box, closed it, put the picture up so we could see it and then we spread out all the pieces on the table. Now, some of the pieces were already the color side up. The other pieces were the gray side up. And so we had to flip those over and it took time. Some pieces naturally connected together. Some we were able to say, oh, I know what this is. But others, it took time. We had to study and keep referencing the picture on the box. We also took a few days to complete the project. So we had to carve out intentional time to look and fit things together and keep looking at the box. Well, in a greater way, this is the reality of what it looks like to walk as those who are wise, redeeming the time to know God's will. Instead of a box, we look at the Bible. We look at scripture. We look at the things that it's well obvious, God, you tell me in scripture not to commit these sins. That's like the pieces of the puzzle with the picture already standing and they fit easily. But some things are very challenging. Lord, should I take this job or not? Lord, should I move here? Lord, should we buy this? Lord, should we save this? Lord, should I share this? Now we begin to struggle with these other more challenging nuances, but the good news is we keep looking back at scripture and saying, Father, give us insights. Wise living also knows that it's not God's will for us to be going around living under the influence of alcohol or other substances or even our emotions. Too much alcohol and abusing it clouds our judgment. We can't see or think straight and we do things that are out of our character. Alcohol abuse leads to what Paul says, debauchery. That's someone who gives themselves over in their behavioral lifestyle choices to things that are a waste. 
So often people who are under the influence of uh, substances or even their emotions, their actions don't produce things that are beneficial for themselves or for others. So they wake up one day and they realize they have nothing to show for their life. What Paul is saying is that there's going to come a day when we stand before Jesus. And he's going to say, what did you do with the gospel? How did you imitate God? What are the good deeds that you initiated? What are the godless deeds that you ignored? And we're going to have to give an account for the lives that we lived as followers of Christ. We must recognize that every day God is giving us opportunities to maximize the moment. So we must make every moment count. So rather than being under the influence of a foreign substance, even emotions that are out of whack, Paul says, instead be filled with the Spirit. This is a command to be controlled or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And this is a command that is to be continual. It's a command that is actually in the passive, which means that somebody else actually fills us up, that we don't fill ourselves. You know, this morning before driving out to Riverside, we live in Long Beach. We had to go to the gas station so I could fill the car up with gasoline to get us to Riverside and back to Long Beach. Now, the reality is, is that in a greater way, every day we recognize that there's this sometimes we got to stop in life, pull over and take the intentional action of being filled by God, the Holy Spirit. Now, when we are filled by God, the Holy Spirit, that is is meaning that moment by moment, passively, we receive the Holy Spirit's influence and strengthening so we can now be imitators of God, initiating good deeds while ignoring godless deeds. But I also want you to understand this truth. Being Spirit-filled is not for self-centered reasons. Being spirit-filled is not for me to be all good while everyone around me is struggling and suffering. See, being spirit-filled is so that we can give edification to other people in the body of Christ. This is why Paul closes with this passage. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this phrase, speaking to one another. Being spirit-filled has a purpose. The purpose is to encourage others with our lifestyle and the words that we say to them. Speaking to one another means that we give distributions of the reality of the spirit of God to others. When we communicate timely truth, words of thankfulness to them in a way that encourages them and strengthens them. That's why we have to go back to be filled with the spirit. Just like the fact that I'm going to have to fill up my car another time, the reality is we must pull over and be filled with the Spirit so we can give distributions of the strengthening of the Holy Spirit out to other people. Now, we are always called to give God thanks in all circumstances. And I'm going to be honest with you, we're human beings. It's tough. It's challenging when your dog is barking at 345 in the morning to let them out to go to the bathroom. It's challenging when your child wakes you up at six in the morning saying, I'm hungry, where's breakfast? It's tough when your teenager is looking at you up and down when you're telling them to get their chores done. It's frustrating when your spouse doesn't cooperate with the great idea that you had, right? It's frustrating living in cramped quarters with roommates. It's challenging. It's irritating. But listen, it's not in our natural mindset to give God thanks in all of those circumstances. So supernaturally, the Spirit of God will give us the strength to be thankful in all circumstances. If you don't think this is possible, I challenge you, read the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, you'll see every human emotion from joy to despair, depression, angst, frustration, anger. But yet in all the Psalms, while those human emotions are being expressed, you still hear thankfulness expressed to God. Grove Church, my challenge to you this week is that when you complain, that you bring it to the light of God and watch him turn those complaints into thankfulness. Would you pray with me? Father, in this moment, we are grateful to hear from the truth of your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would mobilize those that may be watching that have never heard the gospel of Jesus and that you would draw them to Jesus now that they know that they can be saved and given new life in Jesus alone, that they can become a new creation through you alone, Christ Jesus. And for those that are watching that are Jesus followers and they've been struggling with unrepented sin, Father, draw them to the light of Christ. Let them confess their sin so they know they can be forgiven and put back in a right relationship with you. 
Father, I pray this week that you would mobilize every one of your Jesus followers to live on mission by seeking to live spirit-filled every day so we can imitate God daily, so that we can then initiate good deeds and by the Holy Spirit's influence, ignore godless deeds. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Grove Church. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from The prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now the saved. Oh, the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. your open arms the beauty of your face through tears of joy I lift my voice in everlasting praise hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Call me in to 
heaven's sweet embrace I'll see your scars, your open arms The beauty of your face Through tears of joy I'll lift my voice In everlasting praise Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Thank you, Damon. You always do a great job preaching God's word. We look forward to having you out at the Grove again. Grow family, just wanted to let you know, give you an update about our COVID-19 giving account. Uh, I challenged the church to give a little bit extra to this account so we can help needs. Last weekend, you gave $30,000 to this account. In total, we have $57,000 in that account that we can even do more ministry. I wanna make sure that you know every single dollar of that's gonna go outside the Grove to our local outreach partners, global partners, and to those who are hurting in our own community. Um, a couple of things that we've already been able to do, we sent funds to our partner in Indonesia. Um, they're passing out care packages to a village of 1,600 people. And there is a, a half a day's wage. There's masks, uh, there's sanitizers, just things that their community needs. We also send funds to our partners in India. Same thing, they have these care packages they're sending out. They're, ha they're handing out a full day's wage, um, some food, sanitizer, just different things that they need. Um, it's not like the United States of America where we receive stimulus checks. A lot of these governments aren't able to care for their people in that way. So just know that the donation that you gave, it's helping hundreds of people. Um, we are also giving additional funds and food to Path of Life Homeless uh, Ministry. Grow Family, you've really stepped up uh, in a huge way. We're now cooking two meals a week, um, also doing meals on, on the weekend for the family shelter. And then we're able to give additional funds just for the lack of food donations that they're receiving. And that's coming out of the COVID-19 account. And then also we're buying sanitizers for people in the community, masks. Um, you're just doing a lot. So wanted to say thank you very much. Um, at this time, if you'd like to give to our general fund, uh, which just keeps our church going, allowing us to do the ministry that we are doing, um, there's four different ways you can give. You can text, download the Grove's app, online at thegrove.cc or mail a check-in. And just know that through your generosity, you really are allowing us to reach more people than we have ever been able to reach before. So thank you so much for partnering with us. God bless you and have a great week.